Welcome, everyone. Wait till a few more people slip in here. I want to begin tonight with our land acknowledgement. This was developed um, with help from our tribes in the area and the University of Arizona. We respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Oadam and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous community through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, every year in October, and sometimes, as this year, spilling over into November a little bit, the College of Humanities at the University of Arizona celebrates National Arts and Humanities Month with the Tucson Humanities Festival. So this year we've been celebrating with, as you saw, the theme of community. We'd like to thank our Tucson Humanities Festival sponsors who've helped make this possible, Bookman's Entertainment Exchange and the Humanities Seminars Program. Tonight at this final event of the 2022 festival, we have the pleasure of listening to 14 translators read from work that they've spent nine months working on with their mentors. Their translations are from 10 different languages, multiple genres, and provide us with a wealth of writers, languages, and stories. The translators and this event are part of the American Literary Translators Association's 45th annual program. That's really impressive. Uh, and also part of Arizona Translates. ALTA is a nonprofit independent arts membership association dedicated to supporting the work of literary translators and advancing the art of literary translation. I'm sure everybody who's here will agree with me that translating and interpreting play an incredibly important role in promoting communication and understanding between countries and languages and different communities. ALTA is a singular community of individuals that is committed to the art of literary translation and to promoting its significance in world culture. And I just want to say the College of Humanities is particularly honored to be the site of ALTA since 2019. They're an affiliate of ours. They're located here on campus, and we collaborate closely together. I would now like to introduce ALTA president, Ellen Elias Bursach. Ellen has a fascinating background, and probably some of you know her and, and know about this. But she worked as a translator for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague, after which she wrote a book about the ways that translation and interpreting shaped those trials. She specializes in South Slavic literature and has translated numerous works from Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian. So please welcome me in joining, uh, in welcoming, sorry, please join me in welcoming Ellen Elias Bursac. Welcome all of you. It's great to see all of you here and welcome to those of you who are online. Uh, as, as Kim just told us, we're listening to readings, translation readings by 14 mentees who've been working with Alta o over the last over the last year and some and they've I think it's important for you to know that they have come from all over the world to be here we have people who came from all over the United States but also from as far away as Singapore the United Kingdom Canada South Korea and Spain and the mentors are here who have been working with the mentees who'll be reading and they were all meeting each other for the first time They've been working together remotely over Zoom or whatever over for the last nine months, but now they actually have the opportunity of spending time together, and it's very gratifying to see them all having the opportunity. We'd like to thank the people who've made this possible. First of all, Tyler Meyer and the Poetry Center for hosting us in this beautiful place, and the University of Arizona College of Humanities, which has been our host, our gracious host, for the last four years. And with a particular shout out to the marketing team who have uh, invested a great deal of time in making sure that people here in the 
community know that we're holding this event this evening. And the two Tucson Humanities Festival, as Kim mentioned, and we're the last event of the festival, the closing event for tonight, and the National Endowment for the Arts. The, uh, at the, you've heard that the mentorship program runs for nine months, and uh, it's an opportunity for an emerging translator to work with an experienced translator. And uh, we have applications open for the 2023 program. If there's anybody here who'd be interested in applying, that's open until the end of this month, the end of November. And each of the mentees this evening will be reading for five minutes. And we're not planning to take a break, so fee feel free to step out if you need a break. And now I'd like to hand it off to Kel Kelsey Veneta, Alta's program manager, and Lissy Jaquette, Alfie's Alta's executive director. Well, uh, welcome once again. Um, I'm Kelsey Veneta, program manager at Alta, which means that um, uh, it is my great pleasure to, to coordinate Alta's mentorship program. Um, very happy to be working with all of these wonderful translators. So our first reader tonight uh, is Sandra Chen, who is our Taiwanese literature mentee uh, for 2022, mentored by Steve Bradbury. And uh, Sandra's mentorship was funded by Taiwan's Ministry of Culture and Taiwan Academy of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Los Angeles. Sandra Chen is an emerging translator from the Bay Area working in English, Chinese, and French. She is currently an undergraduate student at Princeton University, where she is pursuing a concentration in comparative literature and a certificate in translation and intercultural communication. Sandra? Hello, I'm Sandra, and I'll be reading from my translation of Mu Song, a collection of personal essays by Taiwanese writer Long Ying Tai. A quick translator's note, the Chinese word for daughter sounds very much like the word for rain in the dialect of the author's mother, which is the title of this essay, Yu Er. By sheer chance, the English word daughter sounds like rain after it hits the ground, water, which is the title of my translation. 我每天在一通电话, I make one call every day, no matter what corner of the world I happen to be in. When the call is put through, my first sentence is always, I am your daughter. For transoceanic long distance calls, I pause there and wait for those four words to cross the ether and enter her ears. It takes a little time. Then, with her pronunciation colored by her Zhejiang dialect, she says, water, I only have one water. Yes, it's me. Oh, water, where are you? I'm in Hong Kong. Why don't you come to see me? When are you coming to see me? I just saw you yesterday. I only left you this morning. Really? I don't remember. Then when are you coming to see me? In another week. Who are you? I am your daughter. Water. I only have one water. Where are you? I'm in Hong Kong. Why don't you come to see me? When are you coming to see me? When I go to see her in Chaozhou, I, who am used to sleeping alone, sleep with her. It is like caring for a child. I wrap the blanket around her, play Zhou Xuan, the wandering songstress, turn off all the lights, leaving only the nightlight in the bathroom, and lie down beside her. I wait for her to fall asleep, then get up to work. As the day begins to dawn, she comes softly up beside me and sits down without a sound, without a breath. Are all elderly women like this? Day by day, body growing thinner, footsteps lighter, voice weaker, expression meeker, which is to say, 
a person slowly fading into a shadow. Still writing, I say, why did you get up so early? How about I get you a cup of warm milk? She doesn't respond, just squints silently at me for quite a while, until finally she murmurs, I think you are my water. I raise my head, pat her thin gray-white hair, and say, Mom, you're exactly right. I am your daughter. She looks at me with great wonder, astonishment, happiness. I knew it. I looked at you for the longest time, thinking you looked familiar, and it really is you. Actually, it's strange. Last night, there was a person lying in my bed who was very nice, and she also said she was my water. How strange. That person last night was me. I pour cold milk into a glass and place it in the microwave. Then where did you come from? Her face wrinkles with confusion. I came from Taipei to see you. How could you have come from Taipei? She struggles to make sense of this, and after taking the glass of milk, she continues her questioning. If you are my water, how can you be so far from my side? I sit down beside her, place her frail hand in my palm, and watch her. Her eyes are still so bright, that kind of brightness. Under the faint morning glow, I can't tell if it's the residual radiance of her youthful sharpness or a layer of glistening tears. Sometimes, I have the caretaker bring her to Taipei to meet me. I slow down time, taking her on a day trip around town. Our first stop, bathing in a hot spring. As she soaks in the steaming water, she stares curiously at the naked women who fill the space, her gaze fixed. Our second stop, taking the bus, red number five. Throughout the ride, her eyes reflect cherry blossoms as she quietly watches the scenery that flows by outside the window. We reach Shuling Station. I say, Mom, sit here. I'll take a picture of you. She sits gentle and refined, her hands clasped upon her knees. Your water wants to see you smile, Mom. She looks at me, smiling softly. Only then do I realize that she's wearing a black top with a white collar, just like a schoolgirl. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was well, that gave me chills. Thank you. Um, I'm Lucy Jaquette. I'm Alto's executive director, and I am so glad that you are with us this evening, both those of you in person and those of you joining us through the ether. Um, welcome, welcome to Tucson. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our next reader. Angelina Coronado translates from Portuguese. She was mentored by Katrina Dodson in Alta's Mentorship for BIPOC Translators, which was funded by generous individual donors this year. Angelina is a doctoral student in the Latin American and Iberian Cultures program at Columbia University. Her first book-length translation is of Cape Verdean writer Orlanda Amarelis' collection of short stories, Raiz do Sodre to Salamanca. Angelina, welcome. Hi everyone, my name is Angelina and I translate from Portuguese. I have been working on a collection of stories written by Cape Verdean Portuguese writer Orlando Marilis. Marilis presents the lives of people from the diaspora of Cape Verde, a Portuguese speaking African country west of Senegal, whose citizens are largely mixed race, black and white. Cape Verde has a substantial diaspora in Portugal, which is the setting for many of this collection's stories. It was also under Portuguese colonial rule from 1462 to 1975, just one year after um, the publication of this collection. What I find interesting about her work is that her protagonists can often be unlikable and strange when juxtaposed with the urgent rhetoric of decolonial liberation of that contemporary moment. 
but the protagonists don't ask to be liked and often their forms of expression and agency may disturb us. Her work is evocative of novels such as Jean Rees' Wide Sargasso Sea in that she presents racialized women who don't exactly fit into the dominant society of European metropoles. I'm going to read a little from a story which begins right at the middle of the protagonist's monotonous commute as she travels across the city of Lisbon on a streetcar, then a train, and at this point on a ferry, the reader bears witness to her being on the verge between desiring to leave Portugal for good and shuddering at the thought of returning to Cape Verde at all. The protagonist shares early on in, early on in the story that she actually quit her job, so it's unclear whether or not this commute is really necessary at all. So now I'm going to read from the story Disenchantment. She fixes her eyes on the tar that runs in between each of the wooden planks of the pier. The sides of the boat groan, and it advances securely into the mist. Just one more stretch, one more mad dash to make it to the office overlooking the main plaza, tarnished by tome, tomes of paper and withered pamphlets. Good morning, how are you? The motorcyclist will bring his hand to his visor and sit down to take it off. She smooths the jet coarse wisps of hair that are flying loose from under her scarf. Where is she going? Her mind stubbornly rifles through memories that she'd rather forget. It had been the girl from the tobacco shop who had warned her. In any case, she had already guessed at it and warded off the idea, repulsed, that bastard. The girl from the tobacco shop had called him Rat. Rat was married. Look at them over there. Her mixed up with a married man. Rat, no less. It even makes her want to laugh. If only she could wipe the sensation of his caresses from her face. He used to brush his hand along her cheek and search deep into her eyes, hoping for who knows what. That hustler, she always wanted to know what exactly he wanted. She calmly folds the ticket between her fingers. The boat moans and rocks itself. The teacher with the blue coat and blue gloves presses her forehead against the glass. She's scared. She's scared of the fog. And the boat from the Thousand and One Nights glides lethargically through the dense haze. She turns her face away from the man in the black hat. He looks at her insistently. It's not the first time. Widower? Married? A wrinkle creases his fixed eyebrows. Either way, she can't consider starting over again at all. She just can't and her eyes covertly seek out those of the man in the black hat. He's now assessing the legs of the skinny vamp sitting in the back on the right. A smile starts to spread across all of the faces. The man with the long face rises and takes his briefcase. The traveling salesman with the Jewish nose takes two steps towards the stairs. Finally, we're here. They arrived. They have arrived at the door of salvation. The fishermen's wives down below are like stubborn, chattering crows. She slips through the crowd, a solitary stranger in her gingham coat. The man in the black hat is right next to her. She knows what he's up to by the sixth sense he's picked up from these kind of encounters. A whisper causes her to become alert. You all right, man? You hustler, you're making moves on that mulata. They share a laugh, and this laugh is an affront. Good morning, how are you? Trembling, she walks down the stairs, focusing on each step. She is at the crossroads of which to choose. She always avoids walking with the colored people, her countrymen, so as not to be mixed up with them. But in the end, along comes a white man who reminds her of her mixed race condition. Oh heavens, she is a wandering gypsy with no friends, no, atta no attachments, wayward among so, familiar, so many familiar faces. And now I'm going to read the last kind of part of that from the original Portuguese. Oh céus, é uma cigana errante, sem amigos, sem afeições, escarrada entre tanta cara conhecida. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelina. So our next reader tonight is Jack Hargreaves. Uh, Jack is our 2021 mentee in uh, Singaporean literature. He was mentored by Jeremy Tiang, 
uh, and his mentorship was funded by the National Arts Council Singapore. So Jack Hargreaves' work has appeared in Asymptote, Ada, Samovar, and elsewhere. He translated Shen Da Cheng's Novelist in the Attic for the Book of Shanghai, and with Yan Yan, Li Huan's Winter Pasture, and Chai Jing's Seeing. Alta's 2021 mentee for Singaporean literature, he is currently on a virtual residency for young artists in Nanjing. Jack? Good evening. I just realized as you said that, that I'm about to read a piece from Taiwan and not Singapore. Apologies. <laughs> um, this is uh, Kuo Chang, the author Kuo Chang Shun's um, kind of creeping mystery novel with uh, spectral undertones um, about, <laughs> about queer life in Taiwan between the times of um, martial law and marriage equality. So I'm starting from the beginning. Uh, chapter one, that night. We'd best begin in 1985, a third of a century before rainbow flags, red ribbons, and E were even a glittery twinkle in our eyes. For sure, one needed to be extra careful back then. All Taiwan had was three newspapers in those days, globalization still a ways off, and information was as hard to come by as imported cigarettes and alcohol, a fat chance of finding a lick about our world. Even in Taipei, the man in the street struggled with basic English. No point asking any old passerby, excuse me, where might I find a gay bar? They'd think it was a name for their unmentionables. And Tongzhi, don't forget this is the era of martial law we're talking about. Tongzhi still meant plain old comrade. It was really asking for it to go around proclaiming love for yours, even if you did mean it the communist way, not the gay one. So how to describe Melody? You just didn't. You followed someone in the know while you were asking for a thorough frisk and questioning, in case you were out to cause trouble. Subtlety was key. You had to learn the art of passing, avoid letting your hanky hang for all to see. That was why Melody didn't stand out either. It didn't even have a karaoke machine when it opened. These were the days when economy-wise, Taipei was still dragging its heels behind Manila and Kuala Lumpur. And beggars couldn't be choosers. It was a stroke of luck Melody existed at all. Say, do you remember when karaoke machines were the latest thing? You'd have this big binder of lyrics, no screen, of course, and you had to find the right eight track for the song. There were 16 tunes to a tape, tops, and you had to find, uh, but the things were as thick as books. And Melody was all of 30 square meters, if that. You could have pulled out the bar and the stools, and it'd still have been a tight squeeze. Where'd they find space for all those tapes? Bursting to sing your heart out, you had to wait for the invention of digital song selection first, honey. Sure, Cashbox Party came along and everyone went there to butcher their favorite songs. But we all knew in this town that a gay bar wasn't a gay bar without a karaoke machine. A lot's changed in these past 30 years, but you can bet that those things are still standing. Got vocal chops? Who cares? It's never been about that. It's about getting in the spotlight. When a joint is pitch black, how else will people see you? Imagine all that effort getting dolled up, gone to waste. And the best part was that people in Taiwan really didn't know English back then. How they came up with a flashy name like Melody beats me. They didn't actually use English letters, though. It was written in Chinese. Mele Di, beautiful, happy place. It does have a certain je ne sais quoi to it, doesn't it? This was the art of passing at its best. Any guy on the street would figure the bar was a place of foreign business, and that meant the police steered well clear. Tex Hound pulled the same trick 20 years later, only to die a quick death. The logic went, as long as the English was on the card, it didn't matter that regulars called the nightclub Tai Kushuang. The Taiwanese are having one hell of a time. You knew just what you were in for with a nickname like that. There were, of course, other gay bars besides Melody way back when. Tong Xinqia, or Hartsbridge, must have been the first of them to install a karaoke machine. Then there was Chongqing, with its tiny dance floor jammed every night with men doing the tango or the jitterbug. And on the weekends, guys didn't even wait until the lights were out at First Hotel on North Zhongshan Road 
before the grubby alley next to it had strings of young men sneaking in and out. In some basement down the end of that alley was 10, which arguably had the most classic code name of them all, although half the guys didn't get the joke until they saw it written out. 10 made disco a thing in Taipei. When it opened, it was all anyone could talk about. A few glass-closeted film and TV stars even showed their faces there. That gave the pretty boys there something to gawp at. Back then, Lao Chi was still a fresh-faced 20-year-old himself. Tall, handsome, a bit of a bad boy, a hairdo that was half product. He turned heads whenever he stepped out onto the dance floor at 10, had men almost drooling over him, and he ate it all up. It wasn't long after Lao Chi returned from military service that he ran into the old shift manager for 10, Lao San, who mentioned that their friend Chao Go wasn't just some TV singer on a contract anymore. He'd hit the big screen getting his big break as second lead in an art house love story. The two of them were looking to invest in a space they could call their own, somewhere friends could bring friends or make friends. But the art films fizzled out two years later. So instead of playing the nice guy who never got the girl, Chow Go got out while the going was still good, lit out for Canada and got married apparently, which left Lao Chi as the only one willing to help Lao San keep the place going. It was the two of them who came up with the name Melody. They had plenty of luck, too, more than just about any of their competitors back then, anyway. But nobody could have guessed that Melody would still be going strong in the new millennium, all the way till today. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. That was excellent. Uh, I hope there's karaoke in uh, many of your future. Uh, so our next translator is Brad Harmon. He translates from the Swedish. He was mentored by Kira Josephson uh, on Alta's Swedish mentorship, which was funded by the Swedish Arts Council. Brad is a translator primarily from Swedish and German. He studied Scandinavian and German studies at the universities of Minnesota and Washington. He is currently a PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. And his first book translation was Mons Mosesson's Tim, the official biography of Avicii. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Who Killed Bambi by Finnish author Monica Fagerholm. Better? There we go. Yeah. Okay. So he'll, Who Killed Bambi uh, by Finnish author Monica Fagerholm is a stylized tale of moral bankruptcy. Um, it traces the fallout following a gang rape committed by a group of boys in a wealthy upper class Finnish suburb. Their attempts to cover it up and forget and how it nonetheless erodes everyone involved. The main character, Gusten, is, on, is the only one to admit um, and to accept his responsibility and face the consequences. But his childhood best friend, uh, Nathan Haggart is the instigator and the only one convicted. Um, so this passage comes at the end of the novel, um, which won the uh, 2020 Nordic Council Literature Prize. Um, and it's been, it's being adapted into a film too. Um, and I do want to give a trigger warning as well. Det var kvällen då domarna hade fallit och han kom hem sent. Han satt ensam i mörkret, tryckte upp sin mor på Skype De fick inte förbindelsen att fungera, men han såg henne. It was the night the verdicts were announced, and he came home late. He was alone in the dark when he called his mom up on Skype. They couldn't get the connection to work, but he saw her. The mouth that went on and on. He clicked her into a minimized window in the corner of the screen and turned down the volume. Then he went on Facebook and saw that Annalise Haggart had been replaced by a new face temporary appointment, according to a newly arrived press release from her firm, the think tank, the Gold Fountain. A younger man, up and coming, in politics. All it said about Annalise Haggart was that she had gone on sick leave. So it didn't say put on sick leave, but gone on, which of course meant it what everybody already knew, that she was, would be, fired. And, the firm's, in, the, and in the firm's own press release, her name wasn't mentioned, just her title. That's why this information was broadcast alongside a photograph of that shouting horse face in the online edition of the evening paper. Hoggart fired after rape scandal in home. For a moment, he thought she would call, had called, would have tried to get in touch, grabbed his phone to check missed calls, but it was absurd. 
why would she call? Obviously, she hadn't called. And suddenly, he just roared and put Mama back into full screen. That frozen mouth, that face, he of course knew that the connection was broken a long time ago. There was just her picture left on the screen. So he screamed right back at it. Mama, I don't want to go to the Alps. I want to face my punishment. So that's where he'd been that whole long night. And yet another living room in the suburb with the golden boy. So Nathan, the head boy, who was in bed with a cold and a migraine, had not been present. And now the trauma therapist, too, the celebrity psychologist, Carol Esprant, known from a TV talk show and for the book, which he had written, The Giraffe on the Porch, who, according to the parents' previous collective decision, would work with the boys in the aftermath in the form of a number of completely unofficial gatherings. They would have the opportunity to talk things out, blow off a bit of steam, just process what happened behind closed doors, out of reach of all those eyes and ears, just them and the therapist. Yes. He'd already been to a few of those sessions, Gustin, at the home of Carolus Brandt, because like everyone else in his family, he also lived there in the same web of houses, including that mug, his baby cousin, the up-and-coming filmmaker Cosmo, pressing itself up against the glass on the other side of the door so he could soak everything up. And what they had agreed on this night was the group trip for the Golden Boys, led by Brandt, the psychologist. Though he didn't say Golden Boys, he said guys. Howdy, guys, over and over again. The whole gang, as one of the few fathers involved hazarded with youthful enthusiasm as if it were the junior national team heading somewhere, followed by an audibly relieved laugh. The worst was over, but we should have some aftercare as well, as promised. A trip to a ski resort in the Swiss Alps. In the Swiss Alps. Perhaps we could get some skiing in too, though that part wasn't said out loud. And if it was, then it was mostly in passing. Because here, now, in the living room with Carolus Brandt present, it was the therapy itself that would be the sinister focus as a backdrop at the very late least. The numerous group conversations with the boys, hey guys, that were to be taking place in a luxurious ski cabin in the Alps. Brochures were circulated, including price ranges. So what do you say, boys? Looks nice, Cosmo observed. Zelamze, it's supposed to be nice this time of year, which made room for Carolus to speak up sharply. That's enough, Cosmo. For the last time, you're not coming. But now he's screaming like this, Gustin, all alone at home at Mama on the screen, and she's staring back at him, motionless. But she's there, her voice suddenly audible as if from a distance, from outer space. And there's a laugh, too, a harsh one. What do you mean, go to jail? But you're, the, you're not the one who was convicted, dear. You were acquitted. She says it with such an unabashed, almost glib joy, and adds, we have to move forward now, Gustin. A nearly endless motherly softness. And at once, in a single moment, it occurs to him that maybe there wasn't such a big difference between her, Angela, and the other moms after all. She was begging for mercy, mom. So he clicks her away, and then onward into this night, puts on his jacket, walks out, down to the bridge where he'll jump into the dark water, die. But he goes to the Haggard house first, stands there and stares in at Nathan, in Nathan's atrium, its light beaming out far and wide, no curtains cover the windows. Track lighting radiates down from the ceiling, so bright that it's almost white. And there's music booming, making the window panes vibrate. Gustin moves closer, so close that he nearly brushes up against the window, making no effort to hide. Nathan is sprawled on the floor in the middle of the room, staring at the ceiling. On his back, motionless, like a corpse. It looks dramatic. Is Nathan dead? Meh. This was a familiar scene for Gustin. Nathan always sprawled out like that when he was drunk, absolutely fucking wasted, couldn't stay on his feet. And that's what's happening here, too. He's dead drunk. He doesn't see Gustin, and yet it's as if he senses a shadow on the other side of the window because suddenly he tries to get up unsuccessfully and falls down again on all fours and crawls across the floor towards Gustin, who's standing on the other side and staring in. It's a remarkable moment, in a way because Nathan is so far gone, and it's nearly unthinkable that in, strong, that in the strong light bathing the room, he would be able to make out Gustin outside. And yet, Nathan creeps closer. Nathan on all fours, all fours, like an animal. Nathan is an animal. Thanks, Brad. Well done with a very difficult text. 
Uh, so our next reader is Tamina Hauser. Um, Tamina is our Korean prose mentee for this year, mentored by Janet Hong. Uh, and her mentorship was funded by the Literature Translation Institute of Korea. Tamina Hauser is a translator and editor based in South Korea. At university, she majored in translation and Korean studies. She subsequently spent several years in Hong Kong working in the publishing industry. In 2020, she received the LTI Korea Award for Aspiring Translators and is currently enrolled at LTI Korea's Translation Academy. Tamina. So I will be reading from Future Walking Practice by Park Sol Mae, a coming of age story of an aspiring writer told in the style of a stream of consciousness novel. Sumi is a young girl longing for escape because of her connection with her Onni, an older sister called Yunmi, recently released from prison. On the one hand, Sumi feels a sense of curiosity about her Onni's history, but on the other hand, she's ashamed to be associated with her. Jongsung은 단맛이 나는 부드러운 계란 마리와 소세지 볶음 우엉 조림 같은 것을 자주 사 왔는데 엄마가 일본인이어서 중학교에 들어와서야 김치볶음밥을 처음 먹어보았다고 했다. Jongsung often brought things like soft, sweet-smelling omelette rolls, stir-fried sausage, or braised burdock for lunch. But since her mother was Japanese, she said it wasn't until middle school that she tried kimchi fried rice for the first time. How about tteokbokki? Yeah, of course I've had them. Jongsung and Sumi browsed around the library, then ate kimchi fried rice and ramen in the basement canteen. They kept talking about how tasty the food was and ate it all without leaving anything. Jongsung got their coffees from the vending machine. They thought it tasted both bitter and sweet. You know you're on me? Yeah? Do you know what happened? What are you talking about? You don't know anything? I'm not sure what you mean. Jongsung told Sumi her Onni had been one of the people who set fire to the American Cultural Center near Yongdusan Park. Oh, I didn't know that. We don't talk about that kind of thing at home. Sumi looked a little startled while she said this. And even though it was the truth, she was worried she might look like she was lying. I just found out too, but I can't remember something like that ever happening. So that's why I asked you. Well, I'm not really sure. Weren't we in elementary school when it happened? Jongsung said she couldn't remember much from when she was little. On the contrary, Sumi remembered her childhood very well the time when she and her brother had gotten lost, how her brother had liked the giraffes at the zoo, going to the department store with her mother, her father coming home late and taking them out for barbecue short ribs. Sumi wasn't very surprised. She had suspected something along these lines based on what her mother had said and the conversations of adults she'd overheard. Piecing these things together, she gotten a rough idea and it seemed she'd been waiting for this moment. It was something she'd vaguely known and while listening to other people talk, she'd wondered if it was really such a big deal, whether her whole future was ruined, whether she would get caught, whether someone would stand in her way, no matter how hard she worked. Just like when she gazed at Yunmi's face and thought she had no future. Would she be drawn into this net as well? Deep in her heart, she thought, no, that wouldn't happen. But right then, it felt like it could actually happen. But I'd run away and escape into the belly of a fish. A fish so big that even when it's in the water, there's enough air inside. No one would know me there. I'd be like the clock in a classroom. No one pays attention to it. But when the time comes, it'll chime and make everyone look up. Sumi told herself she had a place to escape to, a place to go when that final moment came. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything, Jongsung said. I thought you knew. Sumi said she hadn't known, but it was okay. As they walked toward the sea, Sumi thought it would be nice if the wind would claw at her. I might just disappear like this, or maybe someone would jump into the sea to rescue me. Not knowing what her friend was thinking or what kind of expression she had on her face, Sumi wished the wind would mess up her hair. After sitting quietly for a while, they shared a cup of cocoa, then boarded the bus and headed home. A car was parked on her street, 
and Sumi wondered if this was the strange thing Yunyi had meant. If this moment was when she should lie. If this would count as lying. If the things she blurred out were also lies. Thinking these things, Sumi went home. How old do I look? I'm too young to go anywhere, but I don't want to grow old so quickly. I want to live as an adult and die before I grow old. How old would that be? After attending high school and college at around 27 years old, she might then be an adult who wasn't too old. Yunmi had been a good student, and her uncles had even sent her to college. But now she couldn't go to school and stayed home all day. Sumi wanted to go to college and study abroad. Chong Sung had told her about the time she'd gone to Japan with her parents. They'd visited Tokyo and gone to Tokyo Disneyland. I want to go to Japan too, and to Hawaii and Seattle, to London and Toronto, Vancouver and Los Angeles. Sumi wanted to go to many faraway places, and one day she would do just that. Thank you. Thank you, Tamina. Our next reader is Sean Larish, who translates from Polish. He was mentored this year by Bill Johnston in Alta's Polish mentorship, funded by the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Sean is a psychotherapist for children and adolescents at an inpatient psychiatric hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina. He taught English in Poland for several years and developed a longstanding interest in Polish literature. For his mentorship, he translated a collection of prose poems by Jacob Kornhauser called The Yeast Works. Welcome, Sean. Hello. So this is Jacob's Zosnia, The Yeast Works, and the author Jakub Korn the author Jakub Kornhauser is a Polish poet from Krakow. Sort of a young poet who's also a scholar of the avant-garde, a translator of Romanian, and a uh, bicyclist. And his most popular book is probably a collection of essays about his bicycle adventures. But Drozdownia is a collection of prose poetry that looks at old houses and ruins and abandoned villages and conjures stories up about them in a sort of surrealist uh, Cubist manner. So let's uh, see what that means. I'm going to read the title poem in English and then in Polish. The Yeast Works. In the old building, nesting under a chimney, lived a green woodpecker, decked as a pope. Through a broken window, we tossed him bread and ants. Pieces of wood were scattered all around, and the plaster on the wall resembled a Torah scroll. We did not yet know that hidden in the ruins along the river was a small shul. The decaying leaves smelled like yeast. We observed that the toes of our boots were soaking through. Father never wanted to believe that the woodpecker laughs like a man. In any case, other birds live there as well, none bigger than a thumb. It was autumn, and the snow would not fall until March. Drozdzownia. W starym budynku mieszczącym się pod kominami mieszkał zielony dzięczo, głuchy jak pień. Przez rozbite okna czuczyliśmy mu chleb i mrówki. Wszędzie wałało się drewno, a tynk na ścianek przypominał zwoje kory. Nie widzieliśmy jeszcze, że w ruinach nad rzeką ukrywa się mała górznica. Wiejące liście tak miały drozdziany. Obserwowaliśmy, jak naszym krewikom namykają nosy. Ojciec nigdy nie chciał uwierzyć, że dzięcio śmieje się jak człowiek. Zresztą mieszkały tam też inne ptaki, nie większe od kciuka. Była jesień, a śnieg spadł dopiero w marcu. Later in the book, this poem, The Year of Wind. There was a year when a cold wind blew. The river, the ruins of the brickyard, the local hills, the wind grated over all of it and scared Eve, the neighbor's daughter. And that year a calf was born dead. The kosher butcher set off on a long journey. 
and we picked apples from the crooked trees along the road. We refused to eat the meat, it was horrid. From far off came the sound of impatient tea kettles, nights among hard pillows and coarse blankets. The wind knocked tiles from the roof and prevented us from talking about dreams. It brought only red clouds. That's when I saw the neighbor's daughter Eve, or was it H, for the last time. I remember how she was humming a sad and joyful tune, which I heard many years later at a concert in a synagogue. And then in a later section, there, a little different tone, some poems about the life of the Belgian painter Jean Penser. This is one of those. Playing the flute. In 1881, I played the flute. The roofs of the buildings in Ostend were red, the sky gray. The flute had turned up in the workshop behind one of the paintings. It was possible to sit on the chimney and swing your legs, looking out at the overcast sea. Your pants didn't get dirty from the smoke. Gulls squawked, holiday makers were strolling on the boardwalk. The sky lay in wait of open space. The roofs flowed down to the harbor. A carefully ironed suit and a flute Walls adrift in the back streets, dunes and buildings guarding entry to the city. In the distance is the train station, but that's a different story, strange and not entirely true, like the white houses on the horizon floating away with each successive note. Sean, I'd like to read more of those. Um, so our next reader is Archana Madhavan. Uh, she is our mentee in Korean poetry uh, this year and uh, was mentored by Jack Jung. Uh, the mentorship was funded by the Literature Translation Institute of Korea. Archana is a writer and literary translator from Korean into English. Her translations of Lee Jenny, Kim Hyun, and others have appeared in The Puritan, Columbia Journal, Azalea, and our forthcoming Elsewhere. Her first book-length work is a co-translation of Glory Hole by Kim Hyun, Siegel Books, June 2022, and we found it in the Poetry Center's collections today. <laughs> Archana? Good evening, everyone. I'd like to share with you two poems I translated from the collection Amado Aprika by South Korean poet Lee Jenny. Amado Aprika was published in 2010 and was Lee's debut collection. In it, she writes on themes of identity and growth and makes her mark as a poet with an ear for the music of language. In her hands, words return to their primal state of just being sound and meaning is meant to be awakened within you through rhythm. So the first poem is titled, But One Name. I wait poised above frozen paper like waters of memory bubbling from crystals of ice until a scene gathers in place of an unrevealed name. On Monday, I became a lost person. No, on Tuesday, no. On Wednesday, no. On Thursday, no. On Friday, like the order of the days of the week which ends up lost again despite having been lost already. Your stockinged feet picked only the wrong words and slipped on them. This place is so dark and so bright and so full in being empty. Can I call it an orphan, this grayness, this blackness? My beloved orphan, your heart of today is not your heart of yesterday. The word haystack means green grass has passed through a season and the same goes for the dance of dust swept away to the world's end. Like consonants needing vowels to become sound, you must stop crying now. Like wordless sisters, we roll over to face each other and share nods of mourning. On black paper, black ink scrawls a name. A name lingering hazily. Whenever I call out to you, I feel pain. A name wearing thin from the tone of graphite. We were alone together. A name concealed in the mouth. We had only to cherish the word we. I wanted to arrive. I wanted to arrive even in the moment I arrived. 
How long do you think I can stare at the sun like this? When I turn my head, a face spreads from a small, round sunspot. Where did it disappear to, this light of sightless days lying at rest? The end of the world is blanketed in ice. Melting, seeping things fill my gaze. I am alive in a strange, bluish way. For the next poem, I'd like to begin by reading a bit of it in Korean so you can hear its sonic quality, and then I will follow with my translation. Nasone Param. Kiyoge Supeso Mangake Param Kaji. Udie Moksorinen Toisang Odusu of Sumanchi Oduo. Supuro Kamchugo Paramuro Sobigo. Supeso Param Kaji. Namueso Kurum Kaji. Kamchugo, Samkigo, Sogigo, Sugigo, Chugigo, Muchigo, Maligo, Miligo, Udinen Tieso, Udinen Boxori Tieso, Udinen Udie Chugin Boxori Tieso, Nopalchak Tieso, Kanshini. Spiral Wind. From the forest of memory to the winds of oblivion, our voices are as dark as dark can be. We conceal them with the forest, deceive them with the wind. From forest to wind, from tree to cloud, we conceal and swallow and deceive and bend and kill and bury and cease and push. Behind we, behind our voices we, behind our dead voices we, behind a few paces barely, from yesterday to yesterday, within vanishing time, to the forest, to the wind, from cloud to paper, Maybe from there, maybe to here, from spiral forest to spiral wind, dark is as dark as dark can be. From the forest of death to the winds of memory, maybe now, still, at least, walking, crawling, from forest to forest, from side to side, volition and oblivion and flame and dance and dark and death. From there to here, from here to there, already, finally, we died. And to the spiral wind and forest and flame and water and dance, finally we, still we, to forest and forest, to oblivion and oblivion, our voices quiet as quiet can be. We died, and from the spiral wind to the memory of flame, still already, already again. Thank you, Archana. That was just thrilling. Uh, our next reader is Samantha Mateo, who translates from Catalan. She was mentored this year by Mara Fay Lakovsky uh, in Alta's Catalan mentorship, funded by the Institu Institute Ramon Llull. Samantha is a translator from Chicago. She studied linguistics at Columbia University and earned her MA at the University of Chicago, specializing in Catalan studies. She is currently an editorial associate at Harvard University Press. She is currently working on a translation of Antonia Vicin's award-winning novel, A Hundred Degrees in the Shade. Welcome, Samantha. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm reading from A Hundred Degrees in the Shade by Antonia Vicens. Um, it's about a woman's experience working in the common tourism sector of uh, 1960s Mallorca. Um, and the first line from the Catalan is, I aquest Andreu, vaja, un balitra. Andreu was such an ass. One day, I got it in my head to tell him, I don't know what it's like to laugh. I've never been the kind of girl who goes out with a new guy every week or gets taken out on dates. I can't seem to enjoy my youth. I never knew happiness at my aunt's house, ever. To the point that I need to feel sad to feel fine. It's just so absurd that even if I giggle a little or think silly thoughts, I'm filled with regret. I just want to put this behind me. But Andreu's sides were splitting with laughter as he clung to the beaded curtain. No, he didn't get it. But like a sap, I persisted. Have you looked at the mountains today? They look like they're painted with light. 
My cousin always said the mountains called to her. Her name's Maria, and, but Andreu kept on laughing, saying my cousin and I must have been a couple of suckers. I was dumb enough to let his nonsense bother me. Everything bothered me, as if I had a viper in my stomach. And my unpleasant past hung over me, once upon a time, stories of doomed love, Theo's unmoving face submerged in a deep inner silence. My Thea would nag him over and over again, nervously, pointedly, and all he did was darken his already sad demeanor. On the most unexpected of days, he'd go around chatting, smiling, going out of his way to make us happy, and it was smooth sailing. But as soon as a seed of happiness began to take root inside of us, he'd grit his teeth and return to his usual expression. And Thea would become downcast and anxious, and the stories she told were every day more horrifying. She'd insist. We still owed on the house, and after, and after his first year away, we managed to pay it off. And the very next year, we bought a radio. Oh, don't you remember it? You two couldn't sleep from all the giddiness, and all day you'd play one song, then another, and it drove me up the wall. Then we bought you that crying doll, and then some tin pots and plates. But those trinkets came at the steep price of having to be apart so young. Then, those terrible years, and now. Then Thea would sigh, and her wrapped brown eyes would tear up. Can't you tell? It's obvious they've stopped loving each other, Maria would say, Maria would say sitting on the bed, her eyes fixed on the wall in front of her. God only knows what she saw. She didn't write anymore. She kept the notebook stored underneath her mattress, and she barred me from even touching it since its, since its contents were sacred, seeing as she was a chosen one. Many nights after we turned out the light and I was drifting off to sleep, she'd climb out of bed and pray. She woke up in the mornings when it was still dark so she could be the first one at mass. And when she came back, her face was glowing with mystery. Sometimes she'd tell me, my parents will love each other again. But all I could think about were boys. A group of young guys gathered in one of the houses directly across from Thea's to play music. They were around my age and wanted to start up an orchestra. One of them really caught my eye. And while, Mar while Maria prayed, my imagination raced with all the things we could do together. I like to imagine him chasing after me while I ran along the beach. Then I'd fall, and he'd carry me off in his arms, or it'd start to rain, forcing us to seek shelter in a cave. <laughs> We'd make a fire out of dead leaves and strip out of our wet clothes, each turning our back to the other. Sometimes, I like to imagine us taking evening walks where I'd confess all my hopes and dreams. The funny thing is that when we were alone in a room together, we didn't even acknowledge each other. I'd look at my feet when I saw him, embarrassed, remembering that maybe only the night before, I dared to imagine myself in undressing in front of him, even if we had our backs turned. Because on second thought, even a gentleman would sneak a peek in that kind of situation and my body had begun to fill out nicely at an early age. Thank you, Sam. Very well read. That's funny. Um, okay, so our next uh, mentee is um, unfortunately not able to join us tonight, so I will introduce her, and then her mentor will uh, be reading her work for us. So. Uh, that is Priyamvada Ramkumar, who is um, our mentee in our non-language specific, non-genre specific mentorship category. Um, she was mentored by Kareem James Abuzaid, and the mentorship is funded by Amazon Crossing. So based in Chennai, India, Priyamvada Ramkumar translates from her native tongue, Tamil, into English. Her first book-length translation, Stories of the True, was published earlier this year by Juggernaut Books. With the support of Alta's mentorship, she is translating B. Jayamohan's Velai Yanai, White Elephant, from Tamil. Uh, 
Kareem, thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll be reading from the historical novel White Elephant by B. J. Mohan, uh, translated from the Tamil by Priyanvada Ramkumar. Uh, J. Mohan is a prolific author who has published more than 200 books to date. Um, the novel White Elephant, uh, set in the late 1800s against the backdrop of the Great Famine in British India, documents what is arguably the first subaltern labor protest in the country. Now, the story opens with Aidan Byrne, a police officer serving in the Madras presidency, chancing upon the flogging of two untouchable Dalit workers. To investigate the incident further, he sets out to the ice factory that employs the workers. The factory is an American enterprise owned by Tudor and Company and managed by a man named Nick Parmer. The company ships huge blocks of ice from New England to the glasses of British officials in India. In the scene that follows, Aiden has just entered the factory. One of the men climbed an iron ladder to reach a small window at the top of the hall and released its little shutter. A pillar of sunlight slanted in, in through the opening like a glass beam. At the point where the beam struck surface, there lay a gigantic block of ice. The instant the light touched the ice, its top layer began to whiten. As though protective skins of white fabric were being peeled off its body, the ice block grew clearer and clearer until it turned into a light-filled glass tank right in front of Aiden's eyes. Absorbing the light emitted by the ice block, ash gray walls emerged from within the darkness. Against the backdrop of light, Aiden could see thin silhouettes of human forms. They were clearing the wood scattered around the block. Having prized away the wooden planks from the block that was nearly six feet in height, six feet in width, and eight feet in length, they were gathering the pieces and piling them in a corner. The naked ice block, which had absorbed every possible ounce of light, shone luminous. Cracks and bubbles were visible on its insides. Where does it come from? Aiden asked, unable to avert his gaze from the scene. From North America. We harvest all our ice from the lakes of New England. You will not find clearer water anywhere in this world. Neither will you find ice as delicious as ours, Parmer replied. Aiden's gaze was still fixed on the ice block. It had arrived there after a journey of 8,000 miles over six months. How did it not melt on the way? The bigger the ice block, the less it thaws. The coldness the ice generates is, in itself, sufficient to prevent melting. When the lakes of New England freeze in winter, blocks of ice are sawed out, floated to the shore, and hauled onto vehicles. From there, the ice is taken to cargo ships. We pack them in huge boxes lined with great slabs of salt and sawdust. The blocks are, the blocks are usually loaded onto the lower decks so that the heat from the outside does not reach them. Maybe around 5% of the ice will melt on the six-month journey, but that's hardly a problem. How much does it weigh? 30 tons, the weight of 10 elephants. Aiden's gaze was still frozen on the ice block. The edges had thawed and melted, making it appear like a beveled square, a square elephant, a white elephant. It shone radiant, as though the look in its eyes had become its very form. Still snowy and serene, its subject mountains, their unearthly forms, pile around it earth, uh, ice and rock. Meaningless lines, or perhaps lines with unknown meaning. Shelley, thought Aiden. Creak, the sudden noise made Aiden shudder. His consciousness, reduced to a mere barrage of random words by Palmer's voice and his surroundings, recoiled in horror. Set in motion by an unknown force acting on it from one side, the ice block skidded across the floor. The white elephant rumbled, lowered its crown, and moved forward, baying for blood. The workers shrieked in panic. The supervisor ran across the ledge of the block, screaming and gesticulating wildly. He flicked the whip for good measure until the twang of the lashes accompanied his cries. Another supervisor rushed in from the door on the opposite end, yelling, 
the white elephant set out, determined to butt a few men against the wall and squash them to pulp. Two of them grabbed the wooden planks lying nearby and thrust them in between the block and the wall. The planks crumbled with deathly moans. In that fraction of time, the workers made their escape. The ice block smashed through the planks and crushed the planks to pieces. Colliding against the wall, it shuddered and came to a stop. Thank you. Thank you, Kareem, and thank you for your work, Mumbada. That, that ending is so vivid. Our next translator is Emma Roy, who translates from French. She was mentored by Linda Gaborio in Alta's Mentorship for Literature from Quebec, which was funded by the Quebec Government Office in New York. Emma is a queer translator based in Chojagay, uh, Montreal. She recently completed a BA in translation and creative writing from Concordia University. With her mentor, Emma is translating her first book-length project, Anne-Hélène Clich's Le Danseur de la Macabre. Welcome, Emma. Hi, is this good? Everyone can hear me? Um, so, yes, I, uh, Le Danseur de la Marcasa is um, a stream of consciousness um, dive into uh, rumor, fantasy, myth, and a town's collective memory. Um, it's told in very long sentences, and punctuation is scarce. Um, it's full of tangents and repetitions and details. Um, so it was interesting choosing an excerpt because um, anything that I chose would uh, give one facet of this novel that varies very widely. So I chose this one um, because it's, um, it's, an, it's a single sentence and uh, it gives you a sense of some of what she's working with, with a lot of um, what she's doing. You don't really need much context for it. It's um, the narrator's parents are arranging all the details of their future funeral. <laughs> The other details were not so easily decided, my father and mother not sharing quite the same vision for the interment, or rather the burial rites, religion having been more eroded in one than the other, and the choice, choices being considerable, by which I mean that each item, as the catalog called them, each item from the prayers and the rituals to the kind of efficient or celebrant all faiths being welcome, from the music to the presence or absence of actual representatives of the faith in question, priests, rabbis, pastors, or what have you, each and every detail of the ceremony, whether religious or secular, and of the reception, let's just say every possible option was indexed and laid out for the customer at a range of quite reasonable prices, with the exception of the casket, which my mother decided at once was highway robbery, a shakedown if she'd ever seen one. She refused to be taken for a ride and had no intention whatsoever of bowing to extortion like this as she characterized what was described in the catalog in long, sinuous paragraphs, which were then summarized for her in equally lengthy and glowing terms by the woman at the cemetery. My mother would leave these meetings without having made the slightest decision about the caskets, phoning me to tell me the ridiculous, if not lunatic, proposals she'd received, such as that they ought to buy the most lavish cas caskets possible so that everyone, that is, the friends and relatives attending the funeral, would see just how blessed my parents were, and more importantly, how their children spared no expense on ensuring their parents' comfort and well-being, my mother told me, and she repeated the words comfort and well-being pointedly, informing me that she was not about to be swindled by these temple merchants profiting off her situation. And as she spoke, I thought of how it must be painful to be made to think of your death as a commercial transaction, but how there was no way around it. Well, I'll tell you what, my mother said, as I followed the thread of my private thoughts, I tell you, I don't want a casket of solid gold. A box will do, and I admit I'd be fine with a nice shroud, but apparently the law says you have to put a body in a container before you put it in the ground, so four planks it is, and that's quite enough. And as she spoke, 
I thought of how four wouldn't be enough, how that wasn't quite right, because of course you'd need four planks, but you'd also need two quarter planks, so half a fifth, if you wanted the box to close properly at both ends, the head and the foot. But that woman, my mother was saying, as I calculated the number of planks required to make a box that closed up tight on all sides, that woman was so shocked to see my four planks come barging into the middle of her spiel that she didn't have a thing to say, even though they have a plain pine box sitting right there in the catalog, and for quite a price, I might add, which I showed her, saying I'd come back after seeing what my husband wanted, my mother told me over the phone, because I'd found just the thing for me in that catalog of theirs, a pine box and nothing more, the plainest thing they had, and if you find it necessary, I added before leaving, my mother was saying to me on the telephone after her latest meeting with a cemetery woman who just told her the plain caskets were kosher caskets with holes in them to allow contact between the body and the earth. And listening to my mother now, I thought of how in Jewish tradition, bodies are buried without flourish, with humility and acknowledgement that all beings are made equal in returning to dust. How in Israel, bodies are simply wrapped in stitched shrouds, no casket at all. And maybe this was what my mother really wanted since she just described her quip about forgoing a casket altogether, to which the cemetery woman replied, that in this jurisdiction, that would be considered a crime. And if you find it necessary, my mother was saying now on the phone, I'll write it down somewhere that it was I, and not my children, but I alone, who chose this remarkably plain Jewish casket, which will evidently be good enough for me, since I will be dead. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> very impressive, thank you, Emma. And uh, yeah, very well read. I saw you take a big breath before you, <laughs> before you started. Um, so uh, you're, you're going to listen to me for a little bit now. Um, our next mentee is also unfortunately not able to join us. Um, her name is Lucy Scott, and I am finding her bio. Uh, Lucy uh, was our mentee in Dutch prose in 2021. Uh, mentored by David McKay, and her mentorship was funded by the Dutch Foundation for Literature. Um, so I'm going to read her, her excerpt for you. Uh, Lucy's a translator of Dutch and French literature. Um, her short story and essay translations thus far have appeared in Shenandoah, The Washington and Lee Review, and in Wilderness House Literary Review. Her forthcoming translations include On a Woman's Madness and Off White by Astrid Romer. So I'll be reading uh, the, the selection that Lucy sent, um, and it comes from On a Woman's Madness. Uh, so this is a classic of queer literature that's as electrifying today as it was when it was originally when it originally appeared in 1982. On a Woman's Madness tells the story of Noenka, a courageous black woman trying to live a life of her choosing. When her abusive husband of just nine days refuses her request for divorce, Noenka flees her hometown in Suriname on South America's tropical northeastern coast for the capital city of Paramaribo. Unsettled and unsupported, her life in this new place is illuminated by the passionate romances of the present but haunted by society's expectations and her ancestral past. One steel blue Saturday, she wasn't there. Marble white clouds were playing with the wind. Yellow and brown leaves tumbled from the proud almond tree. The broad elderberry was bedecked with a haze of grainy florets. In a corner, a pruned family of roses swayed. I was 11. The sun burned on my shoes. In the kitchen, I kicked them off and stretched my toes wide on the cool tiles. Water, shade, fresh air, I sighed. I counted the holes in the window screen, which let in the scent of sweet limes. I heard the fluttering scurry of ducks and chickens and the cooing call of the doves, the smell of chlorine and disinfectant in the bathroom, the empty pots and pans, the cold stove. I was hungry. I peeked nervously at the dirty yellow door that had been left ajar. I'd never gone into that room uninvited. Their bedroom, it smelled like tobacco and old clothes inside and there was a wide bed with big copper finials. 
a deep cabinet, too, with books that had merged into a decaying paper mass, a wardrobe painted white, holding dark bottles of liquor and jars of liniment, black liniment for boils, brown liniment that stank, white liniment that burned your eyes, and Peru balsam with its gentle fragrance. Under the bed, boxes of tattered clothes and worn out sheets, white sheets with brown specks like stubborn bloodstains. Three o'clock. I'd fallen asleep at the round dining table with the shiny yellow cloth. The damp wind made me hungry. Where was she? Why didn't she come home? She knew I was back from my singing lesson. She knew the others were away. What could be keeping her? The market was closed. The stores were closed. Maybe she was out chatting with some woman with her husky voice and heavy bags while I wanted to be with her. Pouting, I fell asleep again. Five o'clock. Gentle as a green morning, vulnerable as a pregnant woman, eager but cautious, I pushed the door open. The smell of tobacco, the musty books, and him. I saw him through the banisters of the bed. He didn't even move as I closed the door behind me. He didn't move even when I came right up next to him. On his face were damp grooves. His eyes were sunk deep into his skull. His broad nose moved up and down fast. Pa, where is she? He placed his hand on my shoulder. I jerked backward. Where is my mother? In the hospital, she had surgery. I exploded out, raced through the afternoon, observed from the sloping roofs of the refugee housing. The almond, the tamarind trees, the gleaming canal water, the snow cone man with his red-green cart, they blew past me. The emptiness of my stomach had moved on to my head. My mother, sick, sick, sick? I saw her brown face everywhere I looked and encountered inside myself her expectant eyes. Sick? hospital, surgery. I felt that these things had something to do with white, with steel, with powerlessness, with tears, with pain, with rain, with sand, with deep holes. They had everything to do with a cramp deep in my body and with the smell of the end. I still see her now gazing at the blue-green morning as she swept dead leaves into a pile with a stiff broom. The rustle of the seashells accompanied her complaints. Now there's a ripe almond. She'd already picked them up for me. See the rosebuds about to open. We knelt down together. How can I forget how they waited? The doves, the ducks, the chickens, the flowers, the bushes, and the earth wet with dew. Just as blue-green are the mornings and mild the afternoons when I make my way to her sickbed. First, the other visitors, then the doorman and the long hallways of the hospital, open doors, shut-in smells, the comfort of flowers. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Kelsey, and thank you, Lucy, for sharing your words with us. Our next reader is Shanna Tan. Uh, Shanna was mentored by Julia Sanchez in Alta's uh, Mentorship for Literature from Singapore for Singaporean Nationals, uh, which is funded by the National Arts Council, oh, sorry, the National Arts Council Singapore. Uh, Shanna is a Singaporean translator working from Korean, Chinese, and Japanese into English. She was also selected for the UK National Center for Writing's Emerging Translator Mentorships for 2021 to 2022 where she translated Korean literature. Her prose translations have appeared or are forthcoming in the Southern Review, which we found across the way at the Poetry Center. <laughs> and you too can find when it's open tomorrow or the next day. Um, they have appeared in the Southern Review and the Common among others. Welcome, Shanna. <laughs> Thank you. So today I'm reading from Dakota by award-winning Singaporean Chinese author Wong Koi Ted. And Dakota here refers not to the US states, but to Dakota Crescent in Singapore, which is one of the earliest public housing estates, but now torn down for redevelopment. 
So Dakota, the book, um, is a sharp, whimsical book, um, work of literary autofiction about coming of age in the 1970s and 1980s in an iconic Singapore neighbourhood lost to urban renewal. So the deeply personal vignettes also stitched together a mosaic of Singapore's urban history during those times. And Wong's writing makes us reflect on place as an anchor of history, heritage and home. So I'll be reading three vignettes from the chapter, my take on pantheism, which refers to the worship or tolerance of um, many gods. First a line in Chinese and then in English. So yeah, this extract is also in the Southern Review, <laughs> um, the autumn 2022 issue that you can find in the Poetry Center. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in going Chinese first, 我的范神论, 观音娘娘, 姑姑拉着我的手快步走, 生怕错过通书指点的及时,耽误我当观音娘娘的干儿子。So my take on pantheism, 观音娘娘, the goddess of mercy, unclutched my hand tightly as she picked up her pace. She didn't want to miss the auspicious hour of the Alamac reading and the chance for me to become Guan Ning's Niang Niang's godson. The Guan Ning, the Guan Ning Tong Hu Chu Temple at Waterloo Street was bustling with activity. Burning joysticks filled the incense holders and the layer of soot painting the temple walls bore witness to the incessant ways of prayer. Aunt told me to put my palms together in reverence and wait patiently at the entrance. Guan Ning Niang Niang, very busy one, she said. Then she told me she wanted to go inside first to Bua Bui, a pole divination method for which two crescent-shaped wooden pieces are thrown onto the ground. Whether you can recover from jaundice or not must see this merit-making, she said. After Aunt disappeared into the mist of incense, I craned my neck and jumped up and down so I could see inside. Finally, over the throng of heads, I caught a glimpse of Guan Ning Niang Niang. Her head... Uh, her eyes cast downwards, giving her a matronly look, but I couldn't seem to remember if I had respectfully greeted her as mother under my breath. So the third prince, Ne Jia, in the corner of the living room was an altar honouring a group of intimidating deities. An intricately carved sandalwood chair, complete with dragons and phoenixes, sat majestically in the centre of the room. Every Friday night, I would go watch our neighbour, Asi, do the spirit Mimbian trance dance because he got Saturdays off at this construction site. So outside his door, adults seeking divine advice waited elbow to elbow with bated breath for Asi to light the joysticks and start the ride, their worries and troubles upon the tips of their tongues. Meanwhile, Asi would sit on a chair and violently convulse until his head began to wobble, a sign that the third prince had taken over and was blessing everyone with his presence. Just like Asi, Third Prince also loved tiger beer. He was also covered in tattoos, bruises acquired in the brutality of life. Tu Di Gong, Earth Deity. After the latest episode of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, the kids in the neighbourhood gathered at the field, while the adults remained upstairs, going from home to home to gush over how cool Chao Yan Fat was. We also learned a thing or two from dramas. When the cool night wind made us shiver, we will walk to the big tree at the southern end of the field and form a circle around its trunk. Before pulling down our pants to release ourselves, we will mutter under our breaths and respectfully ask to Digong to step aside. So I've always been a firm believer that where there are humans and land, you will find a local earth deity. When the neighbourhood was about to get redeveloped, the field became a junkyard of abandoned items. Among them were old TV sets, and the cherry red spirit tablets honoring our resident to Gong. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed the extract. And yeah. Yeah, I also like to take the opportunity to thank my mentor, Julia Sanchez, for being like so wonderful and giving me so much advice and guidance. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful piece. I really enjoyed it. Um, and maybe we could do a round of applause for all of the mentors. You've reminded me. <laughs> so um, our next mentee is Elisa Yamasaki. Uh, and Elisa is our, mentor, our mentee this year in Japanese, mentored by David Boyd. The mentorship is funded by the Yanai Initiative. 
So Elisa is a freelance translator and journalist from Tokyo, currently based in New York. She received her MA in Media, Culture, and Communication from New York University in 2020. With a background mainly in commercial translation, the mentorship program has been her first endeavor in literary translation. Elisa? Hi. Um, so for this project, I translated the novella Ikasama, working title, Counterfeit, by Haneko Takayama, first published in 2019. Takayama is a Japanese female author who received the prestigious Akutagawa Literary Prize in 2020. And she only started writing in her 30s, and she first gained recognition through her sci-fi stories. So I want to provide a little bit of context and a brief summary of the text. Ikasama takes place in Tokyo shortly after World War II. The narrator is a female journalist who is looking into the disappearance of the painter Kaichi Hiraizumi. Kaichi was drafted in the war, and when he returned, he returned with a dramatically transformed look, so much so that he was unrecognizable even to his family. After a brief period of working on his art, he completely disappears. The narrator eventually learns that Kaichi worked for a special unit in the military creating counterfeits, forged documents, passports, and even paintings and advertisements. When he created these counterfeits, he would adopt the look of the original author by putting on various disguises. His wife, Tae, shows the narrator a box of fake mustaches he would often use. With this context in mind, I'd like to read a passage from my translation, and I'll first read one line in Japanese, and then I'll read my English translation, followed by a brief discussion. <laughs> I thought back to what Tae said under her breath. She told me a story that Kaichi had shared with her, one that she'd never forgotten. What separates life from the afterlife depends on where you are in the world. In some countries, it's a river that divides life and death. And in other countries, it's a high wall. In Japan, it's a hill. Hiraizumi said that he always found this strange ever since he was a child. Hills don't have a clear start or ending point, and you get from one to the other before you realize. For something that serves as the border between life and death, it's just too vague, don't you think? I tried to picture Kaichi's face as he told the story to Tai, but which Kaichi was that? It was baffling that I had no clue. Before the war, he had a plump face with a serene smile and a stern, rugged face after. During the war, then, maybe the two faces gradually blended together, just as a hill takes you from one point to another and created something new. And that wool-lined box full of fake mustaches. I had no idea whether he was one man or two in my imagination. Blending and blurring in my mind, Kaichi shape-shifted into different men from all over the world. As with any translation, there were a number of concepts and words that were difficult to translate in this project. One of the major themes in this text is hills. The, no the novella begins with the narrator climbing a sloped path to meet Tai, and it serves as an important symbol throughout the text. Translating the word, Japanese words saka and sakamichi was a major challenge for me, as there isn't an exact equivalent in English. Saka could be translated as hill, but sometimes it's closer to slope or incline. Saka michi directly translates to hill path or sloped path, and it doesn't point to the larger hill that it may be a part of necessarily. So it's not quite a hill that divides life and afterlife. The imagery that I wanted to evoke is more of an incline a straight line, a gradation that blurs from point A to point B. I'm still polishing the text, so hopefully this image will become clear in my final edit. The other challenge with this text, or with any Japanese prose really, is that there are mixed tenses. 
The narrator switches from past to present, and in this passage, the narrator's thoughts are both in the present and in the past tense. As a Japanese reader, I actually never even considered this a challenge. <laughs> I didn't even realize that mixed tenses would be so unusual to read in English until I had my cousin look over my translation. In Japanese literature, mixed tenses are useful in creating this cinematic atmosphere. In my translation, I had to go back and unify the tenses in the past to make it more conventional for English readers, and I decided to use the present tense sparingly for moments of deep introspection for the narrator. In this passage, I only used the past tense as it was much too confusing to go back and forth. But um, in future projects, I'd love to come up with other effective and innovative ways to preserve the mixed tenses so that the prose is powerful, but it still doesn't alienate English readers. Thank you. Thank you for that and for that. Um, I love, I, I always love hearing what other translators' challenges are. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Our final reader for the evening, you guys. <laughs> We're almost here. Our final reader for the evening is Kenny Yim. Uh, Kenny Yim translates from Chinese. He was mentored this year by Kairani Baroka uh, in Alta's Singaporean Literature Mentorship, which is funded by the National Arts Council Singapore. Kenny's writing has appeared in Sampan, the only bilingual Chinese-English newspaper in New England. He is studying library and information science. He has taught across ages, most recently working as an English teacher for dim sum cooks at a restaurant in Boston Chinatown. Kenny, welcome. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'll read from Tom Sien Yen's diary published under his daughter or I could say water now. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, uh, uh, her, her daughter, his daughter's name is Yo Jin. I'll read in uh, Mandarin first, um, and I'll read in both Mandarin and Cantonese, um, because I think the combo of the two is really where the truth lies. 日本對東南亞展開慘無人道的侵略後,我和許多同朝地替的熱血青年都希望能拿起長幹子和長把無人的侵略者決一次戰。And then uh, now in Cantonese. 日本對東南亞 Din Japan in Southeast Asia began once I and some hot-blooded young people were able to pick up our guns against the aggressor um, uh, who we were uh, fighting to the bitter end. In 1940, I flew with resolve to Chinese mainland Chongqing, underwent the strict Chongqing Military Academy training, which lasted for two years. After finishing military training in Chongqing, I transferred to various military zones to fight. A military career filled with crises and unparalleled hardships started from there. The Malaysian Political Action Memorial Diary is my personal experience as a member of Force 136 and is the true recollection of the work I did. The troopers started off in the spring. We traveled as a group of 10, including me, under the command of Lin Yaping, Major General, from China's Chongqing, we flew to India with English government's cooperation, organized a resistance against the Japanese troops, and launched the Lulaya Working Behind Enemy Lines campaign. We were under the jurisdiction of the Southeast Asia 136th Armed Forces Battalion. 
Once we arrived at Calcutta Airport, we were welcomed by Dai Wei Su and Bo Lung, two distinguished English officers. These two people spoke fluent Cantonese, so in terms of communication, it was exceedingly convenient. A mutual feeling arose quickly, spanning a gulf of ethnicities, which initiated a common cause in the war effort. After a short stay in Calcutta, we hurried to leave India, the place of Mahatma Gandhi's birth, to a training camp not much further, Old Mount Baldy. That was one bleak and desolate empty mountain, which was several thousand feet above sea level. You couldn't even see a, pe a person's shadow, and grass and wood didn't grow. In the day, the temperature was dry and hot, and by nightfall, it was unusually cold and frigid. We started feeling nervous to receive training for our careers, focused and insatiably absorbing the allied forces imparting to us special combat skills. Round the clock, bomb and gun shocks all over our mountain encampment. We climbed mountains and passed through ridges, no matter if it were starry night or rainy weather, not wavering in the least, stopping to continue all kinds of practical drills and exercises. We exploded metal tracks and bridges, destroyed transportation tools, sometimes sinking deep into the water, using magnetic bombs to sink ships. We used interceptors and carried out secret attacks and guerrilla tactics, making use of the dead of night to march, walking toward dozens or so barracks to make trouble, recklessly destroying, sometimes also moving by sea to remote regions, relying on maps and compasses, landing at assigned areas, heading in to ask about special military assignments, as well as sink deep into Mumbai, the big city, prying intelligence offices to discover dangerous assignments. We worked day in and day out, often through the night, no shut eye, wildly learning all sorts of unavoidable guerrilla tactics used for completing assignments. We moved from the mountaintop to the seashore, in the midst of toil and turmoil, practicing how to sail a boat and how to operate a two-person landing rubber boat. We were unafraid of wind blowing and rain pelting, immune to fatigue, eventually becoming one with the ocean, practicing over and over the technique of lowering the submarine and landing. Each time, if you weren't careful, you could let the stormy waves turn you into a clown. Those of us who fell into the water, needless to say, learned the salty and bitter taste of the seawater. If the wind was strong and the moon was dark like at night, great and tempestuous waves swallowed the sounds of our cries for help. We would inadvertently be swept away by the giant waves that reached the skies, colliding with the rock and be badly battered. And once saved, we were left with only half a life. Like this, over and over again, we went through numerous hardships and training. We eventually were able to, in the middle of the great waves, control that small boat. The difficult professional training surprised us, and the quiet day of our departure arrived. Thank you. That was just that was just wonderful. Thank you all so much, um, and thank you everybody for coming. All of our um, people who are watching the live stream as well. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's been part of the Tucson Humanities Festival, which is now complete for 2022. If there's something that you missed, something you'd like to see again, something you want to share with friends, um, recordings can be found online. And we have postcards at a table that will have the, the website address on it that you can uh, look at. So I encourage you also to visit the website for the Tucson Humanities Festival. Sign up for our mailing list if you're interested in being notified when the 2023 festival theme and lineup are announced. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening.